WordPress and Higher Ed panel. Um, I think we'll start off by introducing ourselves. Uh, I, my name is Greg Alperman. I'll be the moderator today. Uh, I think my job will be to take questions and stand back and keep my mouth shut. Uh, but to tell you a little bit about myself, I currently work at the Boston Globe for Boston.com. Uh, before that, I worked at Wheaton College. So I have a fair amount of experience with WordPress and Higher Ed. Um, I'm going to start on the opposite end. I'm uh, John Williams, and I'm a developer of Mac Studio. Uh, I've also worked in various other. Is it? This is. Oh, okay. Like I mean it. Like I mean it. Like Once more with feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm working a lot at uh, BU right now, but I've also worked at various other uh, universities and nonprofits in the area using a variety of tools. But we use various um, WordPress centric. So, it's been a lot of fun. Hello. Hello, I'm JJ Toothman, um, currently working at NASA. Um, actually, technically I work for Dell, Dell I'm a contract with NASA. That's all I have been to work at NASA. It's important to distinguish that I'm not a civil servant, I'm a contractor, uh, not a government representative. Um, uh, so at NASA, I work on their enterprise web program. Um, uh, www.nasa.gov is the most obvious uh, example of something that's part of that program. Uh, WordPress related blogs.nasa.gov is a, um, a site uh, powered by WordPress. Um, and in my past, I've also worked at Stanford University working on various web related WordPress y type stuff there. So, hello. Hi, my name is Ashley Pologia, and I also work at Stanford Web Development. Um, I've been working at Boston University. I'm a lead designer in interactive design. And I contribute to our custom theme framework. We have an in-house framework that I contribute to pretty actively, as well as work with um, school colleges and uh, departments to create custom themes that fit their needs. Uh, my name is Josepha Hayden, and I work with Automatic. Uh, but I do a lot of work and have over the past probably five or so years done a lot of work with diversity in tech, specifically around women in technology, and also um, uh, generally underrepresented communities that I would like to see uh, come through in those STEM fields. I don't have any experience with higher education WordPress, but I do have a lot of experience trying to get it into school systems in general, so I'm here to talk about that. And I'm Amy Masson, and I build WordPress websites for a living. Professional WordPress nerd, if you will. Um, and while 95% of our clients probably are small businesses, but we do a large number of websites for small departments, in mostly at Purdue University in Indiana, where um, departments have research grants or research they're doing, and they need to develop websites to get the word out about the research. All right, great. Uh, so now we'll start taking questions. Uh, you can either walk up to the mic, or if you raise your hand, I can call on people, and I'll repeat the questions for you. So who's got a question? Yes. Well, um, I'll go to the mic. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I guess my question is um, for higher ed, ADA compliancy being such a huge piece of this. Um, and I understand that I work at actually uh, another university, so we're not using WordPress, so I won't even have to name names. But um, I know how important the ADA compliancy part is, and I know that um, most of it is just built into the standard practices versus the WordPress part of it. So to make this brief, um, are there pieces of WordPress that would integrate the ADA port part, you know, easily, or is it just built in independently of WordPress as the vehicle or the powering engine? Well, uh, <laughs> no, no, I was trying to get Ashley, because a lot of it happens at the theme end, uh, like making sure uh, uh, that you're following the, the best guidelines. A lot of ADA stuff kind of boils down to following the HTML specs, like all tag isn't optional, uh, which a lot of people don't kind of get. Um, so a lot of it is details like that. Um, but uh, kind of at a university level, it's a huge challenge. Um, and I think um, it's a little different at BU because I think we're more centralized than a lot of other universities. Um, so I think trying to do that at a university scale, um, to 
there's a lot of benefit to trying to gang up um, because all your websites are going to have the same problems. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 really important and it affects your um, search rankings, uh, and it's something to take very seriously. Um, but it tends to be details that leaving to kind of individual editors and contributors, uh, I think, is uh, uh, kind of very painful because it's a lot. It's hurting cats. There is a big push around accessibility right now in the open source contribution side of things. But we that's, have what, that's what I was essentially getting at. Yeah, we have so many themes and not so many of them that are really ADA compliant at the moment. And we have a small but mighty team of people who are heading up that work. So if that's something that you're passionate about and you feel like you really want to help make the world a better place in that way, we totally have a spot for you. Thank you. <laughs> ADA compliance being American Accessibility. Mm -hmm. Disability Act, so yeah. people didn't know. Yeah, so content managers and people who are authoring, editing, and actually publishing content, you know, using WordPress as a tool to do that, have a huge responsibility in, in that accessibility compliance type stuff. Um, so, in, in my experience uh, in large enterprises like Stanford and, and now with NASA, it's, it's a little odd to see how it is perceived. Um, it is perceived as a burden to these people and you know they view it you know having to create accessible content is something like a check off the box type task thing I and mean, that, that's the wrong way to approach it. it is uh, creating accessible content is the human correct thing to do and changing uh, the paradigm of how people think about this you know not just in education um, but you know publishing of the web in general is is the important thing to stress. Um, so that's my little soapbox on that. Um, to add to that, as Jonathan said, we do have a lot of responsibility on the theme side to ensure that um, the compliance is met um, through proper HTML5 markup by providing alt tags, but um, there's also a responsibility on the content manager's side to make sure that they're using the correct heading tags and the um, basically the correct markup so that screen readers can get through things well and um, can read things properly. So that's definitely a big part of it. I'd say that at Boston University we do a good job of encouraging things like alt tags and titles through some of our plugins. So if you add a link to something, there's actually a box right there that says, what is the title of this? And kind of reminds people to add that to things. So maybe look for some opportunities if you're on the UI end to encourage uh, that compliance as well. And I don't know what it is that what it's like at other universities, but for the sites I work on, it's actually contractually obligated that every all the work I do is ADA compliant. And I find that it's easy enough for me to do, but for the the labs and the departments they're taking over, um, they don't know the rules and they don't follow the guidelines, and most of the time they don't even care. And I don't know where we bridge that gap. So just for a follow up on that, the ADA compliancy part isn't just the um, markup. It's like a whole endeavor as far as forms, markups, and uh, learning, you know, dyslexia. And it, it also applies on the whole content side of things, too, which is, you know, independent of the powered engine. So, Just one other thing I'd say. It's, it's baked into the standards. Um, and if it's not actually, it, it has uh, following consequences for uh, how search engines parse your site, right? So if if you have the proper accessibility tags, uh, search engines and other indexers are going to get that information too. So it's really a strategic thing. There's lots of like, there's lots of ammunition for the art. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go. Next. About uh, it's part a you know a economic issue right these students need jobs but also a 
you know, becoming familiar with how to express yourself in the world. And I'm curious what best practices you've seen in sort of using technology, teaching technology, especially things like coding or just design, using WordPress, but not in a tech classroom. So like outside of STEM, outside of the like the computer science people. So for one, I'm very excited right now. Uh, in case you hadn't realized that yet. So um, there are there are a couple of things in there. For one, uh, figuring out how to frame WordPress, which is a technology in a non-technology way, is always going to be difficult. I'm just gonna scoot a little closer to you. <laughs> it's always gonna be difficult. Um, and there are a couple of, of uh, presentations that I know that I've given that focus specifically on that. So one, to address the humanities question, in the WordPress community, a lot of people who have not yet contributed to it feel like the only way to give back is with code. Um, and really, about a quarter of the ways to give back need you to code. Most of them need some like knowledge of it, but you can always write documentation. You can come on my team, we, 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 I'm part of the training team, you can write curriculum for teaching WordPress to people. Um, there are the theme review teams and plugin reviews which require you to know some code, um, but doesn't necessarily take part in that creative process. And so the ability to, to couch the whole WordPress project in the humanities is extremely high because of those things. Also because, as we mentioned, Coding is a creative process, period. Anyone who doesn't, I'm going to go on record, anyone who says that development is not a creative practice is not right, because you're creating a thing out of nothing. Good for all of you developers who do that. Um, but then the other thing, the other talk that I give that is related to this is using WordPress as a tool and the project to bridge digital divides. So I believe strongly that most of the programs that we have inside our project and most of the functionality of the tool can be used to teach people, teach our young students time management, better communication online, um, how to research uh, correctly and look for indicators of trusted content versus not trusted content and all of those things that go inside it. I would monopol monopolize the microphone if anyone would let me, so I'm going to check to see. I'm going to go get a coffee. I'll come back in a minute. Well, I think that um, part of this is getting the staff and the professors and everybody involved and saying, we want you to do this. I worked with a professor at Vanderbilt who wanted to incorporate it into her classroom. On, it was a class on medieval, medieval literature, and she had her students building this website using WordPress. Um, and I think that's exactly what you're talking about. But if you don't get the staff and the professors and everybody on board and train them on how to do it, then, then we're, we're missing a step. Um, to add to that, you're teaching students, right? And you're trying to encourage students to get into technology. Have them pick something they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And when you pick something you're passionate about, it doesn't matter what it is. You're going to find a solution, and you're going to try and make it happen. So I know I, as a designer, I'm trained in design. But I've worked in PHP and JavaScript and and WordPress and all kinds of other things just because I've tried to get something to work. So if you can find that thing that they're passionate about and ask them to build something or solve a problem using that, um, that I think is going to do a great job in getting them integrated into technology in that really creative way that they come up with. To both of these things, top-down buy-in, and also, you're totally right, getting students into a platform where they are capable of having that self-expression is invaluable. Especially if, um, like, my, my mom is a teacher, she's wonderful, she's doing her own WordCamp right now, so she's not even going to remotely know I'm talking about her. Um, <laughs> uh, with her classes, she has them, at the beginning, put together WordPress sites and do most of their work on their sites and then interact with each other there. So that kind of builds that framework in for like, this is how you communicate with each other, this is how you uh, express yourself, uh, and these are the pitfalls that go along with that, so. Um, the, the thought I had was is kind of along these lines of, uh, the thing that attracted me, one of the things that attracted me to WordPress in the first place was, um, you know, obviously it's a, it solved some problems that I was trying to deal with at the problems but at the time, but, uh, you know, it wasn't overly geeky. I mean, it kind of has this like liberal arts feel to this whole thing. And you can, you can be a geek, but there's an element of, of tech and, and coding and all that stuff. But the free expression stuff is part of it, is, is a huge part of it. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the code is poetry thing, I mean, that's a big part of it. I mean, like, there, it just has this kind of uh, 
open liberal arts feel, and I think you know Matt has a lot to do with that. Matt's you know not a, an uber geek by any you know he likes barbecue and whiskey and stuff like that, and and so I mean it kind of goes into what you guys are saying about uh, the cross section between you know the STEM stuff and the humanitarian stuff, and I, you know it's just like you don't just like you don't want your kids. We're talking about you know turning on um, younger. Uh, people into WordPress and using it as a tool to explore all these things. Just like you don't want your kids uh, playing just one sport year-round. There's a lot of stuff, you know, in youth sports where kids are focusing exclusively on baseball. You want your kids playing a lot of different sports and, um, and not specializing. I think WordPress kind of lends itself to the, to the de-specialization of you know, just being a coder when you're, you're exploring that when you're younger, just being a writer. Yeah, you kind of stepped into something that we talked about when preparing for the we got what so a, excited about it. Yeah, we're really into the <laughs> whole creative code. Segue. Yeah, and I'll just say one more thing. I get frustrated with the STEM label because it leaves something out. Yeah. There's a, um, I wouldn't say a contrary movement, but a, a complementary okay. suggestion um, that we move from STEM to STEAM. Yeah. You add the arts in there because the arts are important. Well, because code is a semantic language and language yeah. inherently is part of the humanities. I could talk about this all day. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, done. I'm done with that. Okay. Did that answer your question, or did we just talk about yeah, it? Yeah, it's great. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah, awesome. we care about it a lot. We'll just keep going. So much. Um, I do just want to say for a second, uh, if anyone gets tired of queuing up behind the mic, uh, if you just like make eye contact and wave at me, I'll, I'll keep them at the time. But I think we're ready for the next question. So. My sense is that most of you uh, work with um, WordPress as a content management system. If I remember right, it started out as a blogging platform. Could you tell some stories about using the, the blogging aspect of WordPress, whether it be for an administrator's blog or in classes? And also, which theme would you recommend for a text-heavy blog? Uh, I can try and... So, I, I'm going to answer, I'm going to address part of that. Um, and this is going to kind of segue a little bit into working with WordPress at a, at a large enterprise like, like a Purdue University is, or a BU is, or a NASA is. Um, so when I first started working with WordPress, it wasn't to build a blog, it was just to make it easier to manage websites. And yes, it got, it got, um, it was marketed as a blogging solution. And that is, that, that's a battle I still fight on a regular basis. So. Um, you know, when you, you, you get into these enterprises and these universities and, and the perception of WordPress is, it varies, and then there's a lot of perception of WordPress of just being this obvious blogging tool. Now, we all know that it, it's, its power is you know, it's limitless, quite honestly. It, it can, you know, probably make you toast if you really want it to. Uh, and, but that's, but that's a, a big part of it, and the, you know, the Drupal versus WordPress thing is, is real, um, you know, at, at these large enterprises. And, and, you know, Drupal is perceived as uh, the, the CMS, the, the Uber CMS solution, and WordPress is seen as the, the Uber blogging solution. Um, so uh, I can tell you countless stories of, uh, of of trying to get people at NASA. You know, that getting the getting the NASA administrator, for example, to, to have his blog on WordPress. You know, there was definitely conversations of. Yeah, WordPress is no good. I should, we should be on Drupal. I mean, I mean, it's just a perception problem that you have to encounter at, at these kinds of places. As far as you know, text-heavy uh, themes. Um, I mean, there's, there's there's countless ones. Most of those. Well, one of the things I I want to do when I'm talking to my clients, at the university, is that um, blogging is really important and they need to do it, especially for so many of the sites that I'm doing are related to research and these labs and, and the speech and hearing language sciences. They're doing this really exciting research and I tell them, you need to blog about this because that's how people are going to find your content. If you don't have it out there, then nobody knows what you're doing. And we, we all know updated content is the most important thing ever. And so um, a lot of the labs that we do, they're Push, pushing out their studies and looking for participants and trying to recruit people to come and study in their labs, and that's a really important part of using the blog. As far as theme recommendations for heavy text stuff, a lot of the default themes that come with WordPress are a great way to, to do that. Um, 
My current favorite is Sela, S-E-L-A. I don't even know if that's how that's pronounced. Um, but it's, it's a nice, clean design and lets you focus on the content that you do have in there. Uh, if you're looking for uh, themes that are great for blogging, tech type stuff. Yeah, that's part of my problem is the words that describe the themes are vague terms like clean and modern. Yeah, yeah you'll find out. It's, it's right. almost impossible to compare them unless you just plug them in and play around with them. So I, I and I would disagree. I looked at 212, which people presented as simple, and it didn't meet my needs at all for blogging yeah. platform. So I guess another way of phrasing it is convince me not to go back to Blogger because I'm not finding what I need in WordPress. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to convince you to go back to Blogger right now. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about themes. I don't have any specific theme recommendations for you, but the way I would look at this as a designer is I would say, go to a sample theme and read an article, read an article page, and see how easy it is to focus on the words and the content. You'll find that the cleaner designs, and yeah, they are marked as clean, and some of those more generic terms, but ones without sidebars to either side of the article, ones with lots of white space and larger typography that's easier to get through are going to be easier for a longer page to read. And also... Um, I'm looking for... I'm, do you guys... Have you ever heard of Edward Tufte? Uh, he looks for sort of density of information. I'm looking for less white space rather than more. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, you're kind of screaming yeah. against the title. So you guys are. I would definitely philosophically disagree with you, but I, you know, everyone's obviously entitled to their approaches. Um, per, I, you know, believe white space is your friend is something I truly believe. Uh, if I'll, I'm not gonna, I don't like suggesting things, but I'll suggest an approach for you. So right now, I think the most readable text-heavy site is Medium. Like reading, uh, reading something on Medium is is pleasurable. Uh, so I would. Oh, so Medium. Medium.com, oh, okay. yeah. So Medium.com, uh, you know, any reading articles on, on Medium, like I said, is it, it just it just seems to go well. Um, so I would approach it. I would Google something like you know thought themes to WordPress themes that'll make your site look like Medium. Like someone has definitely written a post like that. There's probably there's probably 50 themes, 50 posts that that have some attention grabbing headline like you know make WordPress look like Medium. The one that I mentioned is one like that. Sela or Sela, S-E-L-A. If I could just add to that a little bit, my, my advice is the WordPress theme directory can be daunting, but um, you don't have to be a designer to do this. I would suggest that as you do your normal web browsing, as you um, as you go around to news sites, you maybe read an article on Medium or Vox or Fox News or whatever, just start to ask yourself some basic questions. If you, if you have a good time reading an article, notice how wide the columns are, how big the fonts are. Um, if you close out of an article after reading a paragraph, ask yourself why, what made you do that? Um, and start to look with themes that have features that stand out to you as readable and as good for processing large amounts of information. Being dense and information dense and very informative doesn't mean it has to be a tiny text and super tough to read. Yeah, just one other thing. Um, it's, it's good to find models of what you like. Right? When you're trying to build a site, you want to look for a site that already does a lot of what you want. And I always try to encourage people to use the view source and the developer tools. Because if you find a site that you like, and you just look at the source code, sometimes you can find out, oh, this is a WordPress site, and it's using this theme. Um, so that can be a good approach. What is that? There's a whole website. Does anyone remember what it's called? It's like a what, it's like, what, what theme, theme is this? Yeah, I think it's called yeah, yeah. what theme. <laughs> it's something really easy. I don't know what it's actually called. But it's something like, what? Great, so we have a we have a question from this woman up here and afterwards the fellow in the white shirt. Five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. <laughs> Alright, let's speed through this.
who you allow to actually um, update your websites. And I'm just opening that completely up to the floor because I'm very curious to see how another university handles this. All right. Um, so Boston University, we start with we have brand guidelines. They're very strongly enforced. Um, we say this is what you're doing with the logo, and you can't do anything else with it. And that's for all of your everything. Um, yeah, we, we enforce that pretty strictly. Um, I think there are some exceptions for student groups and things not officially affiliated with the university, but if you want university affiliation, you have to stick by those standards. Um, and that comes up from the president's office. We have strong support that these are the brand guidelines you follow. Um, in WordPress, we use a plugin to help make that easier. So it, you can choose between several different types of branding. And by making it easier for people when they just spin up a site, and they have a couple of options for branding, it gets really, really difficult to mess up the branding. So you, you have to really so look at it. So you dictate their theme and their plugins that are available? Um, yep, we have um, sort of a standard offering that we give people. Um, if you need a site quickly, you can use our framework, and they'll give you several um, options for that sort of thing. We also do custom themes for our departments, and in that case, um, that's people like me who are very intimately familiar with the brand standards, who police how things um, are customized in there, and it all still pretty well adheres to brand guidelines. But either way, there's strong support for brand guidelines here, and um, even though we do let site admins edit sites, um, things are pretty well protected so that you can't um, just throw absolutely whatever you want up there. So if you have an outside developer, do you communicate with them that they need to follow your guidelines or mm -hmm. absolutely we have a, <laughs> a, a, I'll hand the, the software to her shortly, oh, but we have that. a brand web, website that they get and we um, do a double check to make sure everything is in place for them. Well speaking to the outside developer that's working with universities, I would say at least where I am, those brand guidelines are not very well um, they're policed after the fact. They're, the information is not distributed. They come back and say, well, we expect all our contractors to know this, but they don't tell you where the information is or give you that information. And they're not, for me, the frustration is they're not telling it to the departments and to the people that are hiring the outside contractors. So the people that are actually hiring me, they don't know what the guidelines are. And there's some kind of, there's a bridge that needs to be uh, built there between us, and I don't know where the solution is. And in your question about keeping things updated, especially when people move on, um, at least where I am, there I think there are a lot of defunct sites, and I don't think that they're being followed up on. The challenges here that we're speaking about are isolated to educational institutions, you know, large enterprises. Uh, technology governance is a huge, I mean, it's a huge job. Um, you know, the centralized governance versus you know. Uh, decentralized approaches, or there's, there's constant tension, healthy tension, if you will, um, and it's an, it's an interesting thing to ponder. I mean, the more, if you allow decentralized approaches to happen and allow more rope to some of these, uh, you know, edge programs, it's the possible innovation can definitely occur. But you know, it, it is there's a lot of also there's a lot of potential for waste. I mean, you get sites going defunct and. Uh, and that's in particular, roles change a lot. So you know, like just knowing who is the responsible person for um, for information that's being published online is, could be a challenge. Do we have time to squeeze one more question? I think we have one person who's waiting. Um, thank you. Thank I thank also you. want to apologize for my Christmas wapu that just popped up there. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I don't know why he showed up. And the screen's locked. Okay. <laughs> you know who we are now. Okay. This, this guy's waving me off, actually. So. Actually, if anyone wants to go, any other questions? Yes. Just really quickly, um, we, uh, use, uh, we use, we oh. use, so I'm working at a university and we use a commercial CMS, um, the Cascade server. And uh, yeah, I know, yeah, I, I actually cry about it. Um, I'd love, we also tolerate, unfortunately that's the best word I can use, WordPress on campus, and actually a lot of departments use it and like it. A lot of people do not like the Cascade server. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, how how is WordPress doing on campuses in general? Is, is the adoption rate increasing? Um, you know, our, I would love to see our campus go full WordPress. Uh, 
but uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, WordPress it's, it's, the adoption rate is increasing. Um, and there are a lot of benefits. I'm not, is Cascade like a proprietor? I'm not it's sure. Hannon Hill's server. Okay. It, it's a commercial it's system. A commercial. It's, it's a big monster. Yeah. It's very robust, I'll say that, but it's also really hard to get a simple page up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing that I, I was asked to look into is like, what are the, you know, using WordPress for um, specifically yeah. educational content versus Blackboard. You know, that's an interesting question. It's kind of similar. Yeah. And, you know, there's a big, I think Joseph can talk a lot about this, but there's big advantages to starting with an open source platform. Uh, I think it's one of the big reasons why BU moved to uh, WordPress strategically. BU's invested a lot uh, in making WordPress successful um, on campus, and I think it's, it's yielded huge uh, rewards. Some of the kind of balkanization issues that I think a lot of universities struggle with um, I think the EU has kind of designed around that problem by making the central service that's offered very compelling and very easy. Um, and it's really done a lot, I think, for the environment. Uh, and I think there are a lot of arguments in, in, in favor of, you know, not just in, in higher ed, but uh, across the computing industry, moving away from closed source uh, uh, products that you can't customize to your needs, um, just a lot of people and security issues? Uh, or you can continue with what you well, I, I would just say, I mean, we invest in securing WordPress. Um, and, you know, we have uh, we have our own access control plugin, for example. So, uh, and we maintain that, and we stay on top of that. Um, and it's, it's an investment that you have to make, but once you can roll it out uh, and have a simple uh, offering uh, that that your different schools and departments can just hop on board. Um, I think it, it, a lot of arguments just fail to materialize. Security is a big scary word that, you know, people with authority will throw around to, you know, squash ideas a little bit. But like like you said, I mean, you just got to invest in it. I mean, they're just they're just hurdles to get over and problems to solve. I mean, security doesn't come. I don't. My belief on security, it's not something that gets baked in to a product. It gets applied. To a solution, so you're, you just got to build build that into your uh, your 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 life cycle of your project. So, uh, what I was going to add about you know how I think WordPress is doing at university. When I was working at Stanford, what I saw is that it's a it's a bubble up type of thing. You know, people it's so easy to install, so it's a big part of it that you know you get people uh, in these little departments um, just running with it. It's not really a top down; it's a bubble up kind of trend that I saw. I just want to mention Modern Tribe just published on their blog a survey of 400 universities and WordPress. Um, so tri.be would be useful. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent resource, actually. It was a pretty good survey. There's some good information. Modern Tribe. Yeah. Modern Tribe, yeah. All right.